we welcome. Doesn't sound any different to me, but the welcome's still the same. We want you to feel welcome here at Sunrise, or if you're watching by TV or however they do that, I'm the technological, uh, I won't say idiot because that's not a nice thing to say, but however you're viewing this today, whether it's right now or in 20 minutes or in two hours or in five days, uh, you're welcome to this service. And uh, this morning, I just want to read a quick scripture to you here. Uh, if I can pull it up here. In the book of Ephesians, and I find it amazing that uh, we're singing about the love of God today. And over and over, it's about the love of God. And when, when someone asks me to do something like a welcome, uh, I believe it's all part of the service. That God wants a seamless service here where... From the beginning to the end, and by the way, uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, whether you're online or with us, but God's been doing something in our midst. Or either that or he's been doing something in me because as I watch Pastor Doug lead and his group lead with him, they come up here ready to give God all the glory and to use their gifts. And that's just not, that's this part of the service. Then we're going to have a welcome. Then we're going to have a sermon. Then we're going to have an altar call, whatever it is. It's all part of God saying, I'm in this place already, and you're welcome to eat of me and drink of me, and you're welcome to take part in what I've already done. In fact, if you'll, if you'll give me this little piece of thing, it says that when Stephen was stoned, Jesus was standing on the edge of heaven. And I don't think Jesus was standing just because he didn't have a place to sit. I think he was standing because he was going, come on, come on, join me in what I am doing in this world. And I can't help it, I got a little preaching, I got to tell you this. Jesus isn't overcome by the darkness in this world. It says darkness is as light to him. And so it's time for us, he said, that we're the light of the world. He was the light of the world. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he's not wringing his hands over abortion, though we're against it. 
He's saying, step into that arena and bring my light to it. He's not overcome by politics. He's not up there wringing his hands because America isn't going the way he wanted it to or we want it to go. He's going, good, because I've always shown my light in darkest places. And you're the light of the world. Now, I'm going to read you a little something. I'm going to quit preaching. Just let the Lord speak. This is what it says. If I can find it, should have had Aaron do this because he can always find stuff on his phone. All right. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. This is Ephesians 3, 14. Before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. Muslims, Hindus, Christians, atheists, agnostics, they all have the fingerprint of God upon them. They're your brothers and sisters because they have the same father. And so this is what it says. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. People, I got news for you today. It shouldn't be news because it's old news. It's 7,000 years old. Or maybe it's 2,000 years old. Or maybe it's a week old for you. But Christ in you is the hope of glory. And not just for you, the glory of God is that all men might know that He is number one in your life and in theirs. And He loves them way wider, deeper, longer, stronger than you can imagine. That's what this service is about this morning. That's what should flow from beginning to end. That Christ is in our midst. And that Christ is the hope of glory. And so welcome to sunrise. And if it's okay for me to say, get loose in what part God has called you to play. You're not supposed to sit back. You're not supposed to sit down. You're not supposed to shut up. You're supposed to rise up, speak up, and be counted for the kingdom of God. And God's been making a way for you, some of you for 60 years, some of you for 64 years. But God is not done, and God's not worried. That's what this service is about. That's what this church is in existence for. So let's have a prayer. And if you're new with us today, or if you're not, or you never introduce yourself to someone I just told Aaron this morning at the altar. I hardly know people's names around here. I like people come up, and I can't remember their names. I like to blame it on my age. But it's also that I haven't reached out and touched everybody that I should. And you haven't reached out and touched me like you should. So from now on, nobody's a stranger. Even if you're shy, all the more reason. Let the power of God rise up in you. And you know what? God isn't honored by if you got a gift and you just keep walking around flashing it. He's honored when you feel weak. He didn't choose the strong. He didn't choose the wise. He didn't choose the whatever. He chose the foolish and the weak. So let your weakness become a demonstration of the glory of God. Reach out. Reach out. And guess what? The glory of God will fall upon you. And the world will know how wide and deep and long and strong is the love of God that surpasses knowledge. Heavenly Father, we're a blessed people. good message, wanted to sing a good song, wanted to see a miracle happen, uh, just came because mom and dad said so, or grandpa and grandma said years ago, you should keep going. But Father, today I pray that your power, your wisdom, your love will so penetrate our resistance, so penetrate our reticence, 
so come into our lives that when we say we don't want to leave the same as we came in, we don't just hope it happens. We believe it because if God is for us, who can be against us? We bless, we praise you, we thank you for those that are stepping out and saying it can't be this way anymore. I want to see more of Christ manifest in me. We bless our pastor today as he speaks. Your word says in Thessalonians that Paul said, I'm so glad you received this word. Not from me, but as it were, the very word of God. So when your word comes forward, we open our hearts to receive it as a word from God. And Lord, we bless you today that you can do this because you are in our midst. And greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And we thank you for it and expect to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Just tying in briefly here, when you were talking about just essentially going back to creation when Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world, I was reading, um, in case you don't know that, I like to read a lot. I am a super nerd. And between reading and YouTube, I, I should have like a PhD or two by now, but apparently it doesn't count. So, but actually this book is for a class I'm taking on the Holy Spirit. And interestingly, it said something in there about justification. And, you know, I've heard so many different de definitions for justification, including being made right with God and all this. But the author said something to the effect that justification is basically getting rid of the guilt or punishment for sin. And I was reflecting with the Holy Spirit on that and started thinking about self-justification. And how often we try to explain away things that we do to take away that feeling of guilt or consequence for our disobedience. And as I was thinking about that, obviously I can't be preaching because it's not my, I already have what I think God's going to have me preach in a couple weeks when I'm up next. So I felt like the Lord was showing it to giving. And so this isn't targeted to anybody, but just what the Lord and I were talking about. So feel free to take this if you feel like this applies to you. Otherwise you can ponder on it put it on the back burner, whatever you need to do. But how often it is easy to justify not responding to the leading of the Holy Spirit with giving because there's plenty of justifications for not doing it. Plenty of justifications. I'm sure right now in 2023, if you're listening to this in the future, in 2023 you can look at in the history books and they'll talk about how bad things were. And one of the, my mentors always said, I never want to hear a pastor say, in this economy, because when it comes to faith in God, it doesn't really matter. And so, I'm not saying that the facts aren't real. I'm just saying that God is greater. And that faith isn't based on what your circumstances look like. It's based on what God's decreeing. It's what the reality of the Holy Spirit is. And so this morning, again, I'm not trying to speak to you in the sense that I've got people's names on my mind. I'm just speaking to what God and I were talking about. And I'm just feeling like I should share it with you. And so, if you feel like you need to justify not responding to the Holy Spirit, I just want to encourage you that Jesus did pay that price thousands of years ago. But ultimately, that plan was set in motion thousands of years before that, that he was already justifying you. You don't need to explain away what you're doing. God's just inviting us into faithful obedience. And so this morning, all I'm doing is saying, just as I can wrestle with it, trust me, there are times where I look at things I want to do. I know I joke about it, but in all seriousness, I'm just teaming as you. I don't... Pastor Jeff isn't paying me six figures in here in the board. I'm not like so bankroll on that. Uh, I'm like, man, this is nothing. It still takes steps of faith sometimes. And I'm just inviting you to be the same faith steps that we're just trying to follow as pastors and board members also. And so with that, if you feel like giving, there's three ways. Again, it's not about justifying yourself. God's already justified you. It's just an invitation to trust him. If you want to step out in faith this morning, there's three ways you can do that with giving specifically. There's offering envelopes in front of you. You can give cash or check if you want to give digitally. You can text Sunrise to 833-345-5945. Or if you want to go on the website app, there's a donate tab. Again, it's not about you need to approve something. It's not about giving the right percentages. It's just faithfulness. It's just faithfulness. That's all it is this morning. God justified you. It's just faithful response to him and his leading. That's all we're talking about. And with that,
Let me pray briefly. Pastor Dan, thank you for this morning again. Just I think we, I, I don't know about you guys, but just that encouragement that we are a light. And so, Lord, we partner with you as a body. Greater can we do together than doing alone. And so, Lord, we just give to you to honor you, but we realize there's a practical element here today that as we pool our money together, we can do more good for this community and the world around us by partnering together with you. And so, Lord, we respond in faith to what you're doing and just say yes to you and trust that your promises are all yes and amen. Not because we want to convince you, force you, can argue you into doing what we want, but we're just saying, no, Lord, you said that, and we're believing you at your word because you're trustworthy. And so, Lord, we ask that you bless this offering. Lord, for those who are stepping out in faith week after week and saying, I'm giving, I don't know how I'm going to do this, Lord, I ask that you would bless them. They would see your faithfulness to your promise. I ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Just before the announcement video goes, if you're an epic 6th to 12th grade or young adult with us who's on the team, feel free to join us. We've got epic going on, so out the double doors to the right there. If you're a guest with us, you don't know where we're going, just follow the, the herd of people running out to join us, and we'll see it down there. For the rest of you, check out what's coming up with the announcement video. Good morning, everyone. It's Michelle. It's that time again. Time for Crafting for Community. First Thursday of the month from 7 o'clock till 9 o'clock. We get together and we visit while we make a craft. Uh, the craft, you get to take home one. That's your favorite one. The rest of them, we will donate to a community organization. Please come on out. Even if you don't know how to craft, we'll teach you and we'll have a lot of fun. Have a great day. Good morning, everyone. Have you ever wondered what all the dresses are in the front of the sanctuary once a month? Well, I'm Michelle, and it's because of Dress a Girl Around the World. Our church is actually the hub for the state of Michigan for this group, and we need people to help put these dresses together. If you don't know how to sew, that's fine. We'll teach you, or you can just cut or iron, put the kits together, or even help us making lunch for the rest of the team. Please come and join us the first Saturday of the month from 10 o'clock till 3, bring a dish to pass. We hope to see you there. All right. I was going to say, how did the ladies get that guy with the beard to teach their Bible study? That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How many of you have ever wanted something really fancy, really fast, really cool in your life? Whether you ever got it or not. How many of you ever wanted something like that? Look what you want. And as which one? DB5. That's the classic. Okay, not the fastest, but the classic. All right, so um, if you had an Aston Martin, what would you do with it? Just drive it. Get tickets. Have a good time. All right. All right. Um, it would be really cool to drive around and show off your, your friends and, and just the enjoyment of the car. Some of those upper end Aston Martins, though, are, are of the sort that would it be a little hard to ever uncork it the way it was meant to be uncorked? How many of you have ever looked at your car and you've driven it and thought, there is more upper end on this thing than I am really totally comfortable to let go? Yeah, that's happened. Okay. Anybody else? What, what was something really cool that you've always wanted? Yes, Keenan. A Gibson Gibson, a Gibson, which is a guitar. It's not a dishwasher. You just, we just clue in everybody else. Okay, a Gibson DS3. What would you do with that? Actually, you said that you got me something, but I, I stopped thinking about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It came along. Well, what, what do you use it for on a regular basis? Church. Awesome. So you're, you're playing something good. How many of you want something that you figure you'll never get? Okay, a few of us. The rest of you already have everything. That's great. That's good. Um, the fact, the reason I ask this is we have been talking about Paul. And the reason I, I really felt convicted to start unpacking a little bit of Paul's story is because, you know, it's kind of like you know, he's like Mr. Super Christian, right? I mean, half the New Testament comes from Paul's pen, as far as we know, from, you know, from God's anointing. 
And, and Paul had you know, this powerful miracle ministry, and he planted church after church. And you know, just one of those guys, you put him in a Christian lineup, you go, that guy is awesome. Paul, in some ways, is almost a little bit, in some ways, no, we could argue, but kind of like a Moses or a Joshua in the Old Testament, a leader, somebody that people look to. And we go, well, that's kind of a special level of Christian that's beyond where I'm at. So I began to, to look at this, and we talked about the fact that the first thing that Paul had to come in contact with was a powerful experience with Jesus Christ. How many of you know it's possible to be in church all your life and never have a powerful experience with Jesus Christ? You come in, you can mean well, you can go to a lot of worship services, you can sing, you can put money in the plate, you can dress however they dress, you can volunteer for what you volunteer for, and never have a powerful experience with Jesus. Now I said Paul's was uniquely dramatic. You know, the idea, I keep I jokingly say he smacked, got smacked off his donkey. Roberta reminded me that there's no donkey in the story. So, so that is true. So he, he, he did get knocked down to the ground. So whether the donkey was there or not, he was leveled. Uh, very dramatic. Anybody get leveled here when you uh, came to Christ? Oh, okay, a couple of you did. Most of us, not so much. It was a little different. Um, so he had this powerful experience. And this powerful experience let him know that he was going to have to figure out how to integrate Paul into what God was doing. God was not going to integrate himself into what Paul was doing. So kind of that first point is we know that we have to focus on him. And then I talked about that the first investment that came into Paul's life was that of community. How many of you know Paul didn't need a lot of teaching? He was already super scholar, knew the Old Testament backwards and forth. He didn't know how to connect what he knew to what Jesus was doing. Some of that came directly from the Holy Spirit, but there was also this investment in community. We talked about Ananias coming into his life and praying for him. And later Barnabas taking him under his wing and connecting him to the Jerusalem church. And my point was, you and I need community. If we're going to make this happen, you cannot do it alone. I am so glad that we do have an internet option, and I'm glad that if you're out there and you're watching this right now, you can see this. I do hear from time to time that somebody was sick, somebody was traveling, somebody had challenges. We've had people that come to this church after they've watched it for a while, and it's kind of nice to be able to say to somebody if we're out and about, and they say, well, what's your church like? I can say, go to the website, watch the sermon. See what it sounds like. See what you notice. You know, it's kind of a good introduction. It's great. But how many of you know the internet doesn't bring you community? It really doesn't. You can chat, you can laugh, you can, but it really doesn't bring you community because it demands nothing of you. When you have to come in here, it demands something of you. Question that just hit me. How many of you have ever come into church and not been in a good mood? I'm not asking why. It might be because of the church. It might be you don't like me. It might be a fight with your spouse, your kids. I don't know. You're not very happy. How many of you know that if you walk in looking like this, somebody will ask you questions? <laughs> or they'll look at you sideways. Or, so it's, it's almost a minimum demand, right, that you, you've got to mitigate what's going on in your face. you got to straighten up a little bit. And isn't it true that at least occasionally... Your attempts to put a nicer demeanor out make you feel better at the end of the day than you were in the beginning. Harder to remain angry if you're telling your face that you're not. Just a thing. So we get in Paul's life, he has this major investment in the community. My encouragement to you then was that you need to receive community from others and be community to others. And the idea is, I've, I've heard, you know, my church is friendly, my church is not friendly. How many know friendly goes both ways? If you're sitting there going, I'm not talking to anybody, darn it, and you leave late, or you leave early and you come late, don't blame everybody else for not being friendly, because it's you. <laughs> Sorry, there's no other nice way to say that, you know. I, I mean, I, on the other hand, sometimes you have to get up and you have to say, hi, my name is. And that's okay, right? How I many of you know that's not so scary? And we have a lot of wonderful people who'd be happy to talk to you. So community is important. The third week, we talked about invent the return on investment. How many of you know God always has a way of bringing good things out of his people? Always. And I say, here's Paul, and he's the very guy that Barnabas brings to Antioch to begin to talk to Gentiles. And I said, that's a big head-scratcher. 
you know, you get this super Jew, and you get him to be the interface with a bunch of Gentiles that are starting to come into the church life. And then last week we talked about the fact that when you have your moment, and you stand in authority, and you know who you belong to, the power and the authority of God are things that are spoken, and the power of God can flow from that. That we sometimes wish that we just see stuff all around us. Holy Spirit stuff all around us. And even in the New Testament, you don't necessarily see that every day, every minute, every hour. There are times and places where God wants to manifest and he expects one of his people to stand and make that happen. Now we could stop right there and say, well, okay, we got to Paul the miracle man. Paul the teacher, we're all done. Not quite. And this goes back to the question I just asked. How many of you have ever had something cool? and didn't know exactly where to use it. You say at Aston Martin, I remember the, the wildest number I heard was the first time I saw the Dodge Hellcat. How many know what I'm talking about? You have to buy another, is it the demon that you have to buy a Hellcat to get in the lottery to see if you can get a demon? Yeah, okay, and those cars started about 900 horse, and they quickly can go up to 1,125 horsepower. How many of you remember back in the day when you were lucky to get 150? Now, I'm no whiz-bang here, but I'm assuming 1,125 is a bigger number than 150. Where would you drive a car like that? What's that? Straight. Straight. Don't turn. But I mean, think about it a second. It, it kind of loses its luster. I have a car that can do 200 miles an hour. I'm doing 25 on the way to the library. Where is my moment? Where is my place? And so the reason I bring that up is, you know, God puts these gifts, puts this amazing power into our lives. He makes it available. And honestly, we mostly don't know where to use it, do we? We don't. Yeah. When it comes to stuff, yes. We, we tend to like nice, pretty fast things because we want people looking at us. We don't care if we're driving 25 in a 200-mile-an-hour car because we want people to go, ooh. That's true. But how many know God expects his power, his glory, his ability to be used? And we already said last week, there's a time for that. So how do you know when? How do you know those turning points in your life when you're supposed to use what God has sowed into you in a way you hadn't thought about before? Go to Acts chapter 13. And we're going to go to verse 38. Verse 38. Of Acts 13, the ongoing story. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that though this that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, these, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting lives, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, how many of you understand that it is very easy to read this and think with what, what you might know about church history and go, well, yeah, yeah, Paul, you, you, Mr. Gentile guy, he preached to the, That's kind of how the rest of the church happened, right? Is that Paul and some other people kind of switched teams from team Jew to team, team Gentile, and it was all good. Simple enough. God woke up one day or woke them up one day and said, do this, and they went, okay. Have you ever wondered which way God wants you to go in your life and you're not sure how you're supposed to find that out? Wouldn't it be nice if angels always came down with glowing scrolls and handed them to Dave, you get the glowing scroll, and it says, Dear Dave, 
I want you to X, Y, Z, P, D, Q, love God. But then you all, I know exactly what to do next. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be handy? And you know, she'll think this, this whole process through for a minute. Paul is, as I've said several times, he is super Jew. Pharisee of the Pharisees, you know, Israelite of the Israelites. He is focused. And God gets his attention. Now, in the very beginning, who did Paul talk to? Well, Ananias, that's a good answer. Thank you. He was the first Christian that Paul really talked to for any length and cared. Who? who? Ah, the Jews in Damascus. And then he talked to the Jews in Jerusalem. Why? Well, he was a Jew. Why else? Okay, to the Jew first. I don't think they even got to the Gentile party. It was in there, but I don't think they even got that far yet. How many of you know he went to the people that he knew and the culture that he knew? And so Jesus was not like this new religion to Paul. Jesus was finally the one he understood to be the Messiah that the Old Testament scriptures had been talking about all along. So he goes to the Jews. Now, there was this moment where God was beginning to expose him to that Gentiles part when he gets called into Antioch by Barnabas, and he has to start being that bridge, that teacher, that connector, trying to see how do we get these Gentiles to get along with these Jews and all of us follow Jesus Christ. He had exposure, but at this point, Paul is still largely focused on what he's always been focused on. I'm going to teach Jews. It's just I'm not teaching them Pharisaical law anymore. Now I'm teaching them about Jesus Christ. Same crowd, same group. The first missions trip, they're sent, they're empowered, they're given authority. They go out to Cyprus, which last week we talked about Cyprus was where Barnabas came from. So they're in Barnabas. Barnabas is a homeboy there. It's all good. The government has asked for their participation, wants to know what they're teaching. God has opened the door there, but they're still mostly talking to Jews. They land in the synagogue every time. Now, this story is interesting as we hit verse 38. They are now in another Antioch, now back in Syria, but now Antioch of Pisidia, that's in what today would be modern Turkey. And they decide that they're going to teach again. But Paul says this beginning phrase. You always have to know, where do you want to start a passage and where do you want to end it? The reason I started in 38 and 39 is listen again. Therefore, it, let it be known to you, brethren, that though that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. How I many of you know that really didn't rock the the Jewish people that so far? That was okay. God had been forgiving sins for a long time. Remember the whole sacrificial system. And even though that didn't necessarily easily exist for every Jew anymore, if you were a Jew and you lived in Turkey, you lived in the Antioch of Pisidia, going to Jerusalem to sacrifice in the temple was probably a one-time life pilgrimage shot. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you were thinking about going to the synagogue, praying, asking for forgiveness. They're not having a problem with forgiveness. But we hit verse 39. There's always another side of the story for Paul. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things, here's the tough phrase, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. I thought the law of Moses was everything. For a Jew, the law of Moses was, was the boundaries of the world. It was faith as it existed. It was what God had decided. And Paul is saying, well, when it comes to forgiveness, it's just not enough. Now, if that wasn't true, if every Jew in the crowd said, no, I'm totally forgiven, I feel forgiven, I'm good, my heart's in a good place, how many of you know they would have let, not listened to Paul, they would have walked away story over? But the law can't forgive you. The law only exists. We're talking about this on Wednesday night. The law only exists to codify the boundaries, to show you what sin is, and let you know when you've crossed the line. The law can't make you righteous, can't make you feel good, can't do any of that for you. Only Jesus can do that for you. So now Paul is saying, the law isn't enough. Ooh. How many of you know right there, the Jew has to begin to decide which team they're on? And some of them, in this story as it goes on, 
Some of them were excited about that. You know, these proselytes and these good Jews. And, wow, yes, I want forgiveness. I love God. I haven't stopped being Jewish, but I want everything. You're going to tell me about the Messiah? That's awesome. And some didn't like it so much. What was the real problem that caused the Jews to react negatively to Paul? Read down a little bit. See, he said this challenge I just talked to you about, but they never say anything about that in this text. It's there. It's a ticking time bomb, but they don't complain about that. What's their problem? Verse 45. Somebody want to read verse 45 for me? I have it right here. I can do it. I want you to do it. Ah, they were filled with jealousy, envy. So what happens? Paul comes, Barnabas comes, they, they decide to have this meeting, and a lot more people show up than usually show up at synagogue. And all of a sudden, well, they're not very happy. I've tried real hard, and I think mostly I've nailed it down, mostly, some days. When you're in a small church, we're a small church. We're a wonderful church. I think we're a healthy church. Look around. Do you see a few thousand people here? I don't either. And that's okay. There are folks who would rather go to a small church, and that's cool, and God ministers to them there. And there are folks that love to go to a big church. But I'll tell you what. When you're a pastor of a small church, if you want to find some grumpy people, find other small church pastors talking about big churches. Every big church is a sellout. Every big church is all performance, and they don't love Jesus, and there's problems there. How many of you know that's not true? It's not true. God can do things at scale that fit some people wonderfully, and the message goes forward. God can do some things that's small and fit people and weld them together in wonderful ways. And you're where God sent you. And that's okay. But big church disease, if you will, was what had struck the Jews. They're looking at Paul, and they're looking at Barnabas, and they go, hey, they get a lot more people at their meeting. They got a lot more butts and seats, money and plate than I've got. I don't like this. And it's that level of jealousy that causes them to resist. Now, what would you do if you're Paul? We know what he did. Well, what would you do? Exactly what he did. Shake the dust off your feet. Okay, I'm going to waste my time. Okay, cool. We, what's that? Tell the Jews to grow up. Okay. I'm going to get in trouble here. How many of us have ever had a problem in our marriage, a problem with our kids, a problem with our parents, and we keep trying to do the exact same things over and over and don't, yeah, but we do it, right? We do it. Well, maybe if I get her flowers, it'll be okay. Well, I don't want his feelings to be hurt. I'm not going to ground him for a week. I'm just going to, I'm just going to take away his video games overnight. We do this, we do that, we do the other thing. It doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Remember, Paul is Mr. Super Jew. He has been, I'm not picking on him, I'm not anti-Semitic here. I'm telling you firmly, truthfully, his identity is part of Team Israel. It's who he is. If you think he ever lost that, you don't get it. Read on into the later part of the book of Romans. When he talks about Jesus coming to save them too. That he prays, literally, that he could be lost so that his countrymen could be saved. He is very seriously focused on the redemption of Israel. He never loses that drive. Ever. It would be so easy to think, well, if I just talk to the Jews nice, if I just work out a preaching schedule so they're not intimidated by what we do, if we just move the meetings farther out of town or down the road, they'll be satisfied. Let's just all get along. Besides, I, they'll let me use the synagogues. I don't have to find another place to preach. I go into the synagogues. It's convenient. And two services, Jewish service, Gentile service, it's all good. 
How easy would it be to just continually make accommodations? We know what he did. It'd be never ending. Yeah. Have you noticed that though in our world, accommodations have always been a big thing? Yeah. You always take care of the loud and the angry and the, you know, the upset and you, you bow to them over. And that's not the point of my sermon. I'm just saying that that in our world happens very easily. It would have been very simple to say, I'm Paul. And I've already had this powerful experience with Jesus Christ. And I already know he sent me to share the gospel. And I already got my head full of all this Jewish law stuff. Who, why would I go to Gentiles? I can do it, but why would I go? I'm really good at this Jew thing. You're right, he did. And Paul came to understand that. But I don't think that Paul necessarily was there yet. It would have been very easy to keep doing what he was doing. But instead, you see what you talked about, Chris, right? I'm done. God sent me to the Gentiles. Let's go. What changed the direction of Paul's ministry? Well, God. What changed the direction of Paul's ministry? The Jews rejecting it. Doesn't that seem on the grand scale to be a fairly low-level thing? I mean, if angels show up and give you, hey, Dave, love Jesus, that's pretty easy to follow. Anybody here ever had, any parent here ever tried to discipline your children and found them less than enthusiastic in support? <laughs> How many of your kids come to you and say, Mom, Dad, please discipline me more? I need this. My life is so much happier when you set clear boundaries. How many of you know your kids probably, even if they respect you, they're not enthusiastically in support of discipline and change? Yeah. And yet here Paul, knowing what he's doing, sharing the gospel message as a missionary, knowing all the talents and skills and abilities and connections he has, Paul is willing to totally change his direction. Now you and I know, as you said, you and I know that he understood God wanted to spread the gospel widely. That's true. He was a wise guy. I don't mean that he isn't. But at that moment, the thing that diverts the river doesn't seem to be that big and miraculous, does it? The Jews were jealous. How miraculous is that? That happens in any human group. They resist him. How big a deal is that? We're resisted at one time or another. And yet, this changes the direction of salvation history. Because even though Peter had been told by God, by the Holy Spirit, that he had cleansed the Gentiles, don't call them unclean. How I many of you know Peter wasn't really spending a lot of time with Gentiles? Neither was anybody else in leadership. And at this moment, everything changed. And Paul and Barnabas shift direction into a brand new market, if you want to put it that way. And the fact is, is anybody here, were you Jewish before you got saved? That can happen, but not real common. So nobody here became a, a proselyte, a convert to Judaism before Christianity? Okay. So back in the old day when Paul started, how many of us would be saved? Because everybody thought you had to go through Israel to get there. None of us did. The fact that you and I sit here and we know we love Jesus, we can have worship, and we know we can praise God, and we can see the power of the Holy Spirit move, is at least in part because Paul, among others, followed the message and learned how to use the power of God in a brand new way to a brand new audience. So what does that mean for you? Because that's where we're always going. It's great to understand history. It's great to know what happened. What does that mean to you? Folks, I think what happens is, is we can go through life far too long doing the things we've always done. Can't we? How many of you know certain things really well? You can keep the house running. Is there any shame in that? Is there any sin in that? No, nope. it's a good thing to do. How many of you know some job, some trade, something that you do to make money and pay bills? 
you're scaring me because only about a third of you are raising your hand. So the rest of you, I don't know what you're up to. But, but however that works, you're all independently wealthy. That's, that's good stuff. So I'm going to assume that you know whether you know it or whether you're just guessing. You're, you're trying to do something, right, to make this happen. And that's a good thing. Folks, a lot of Christians, and again, just like Pastor Brian said earlier, I don't, don't worry, I don't have a list in my head. Well, this person, yeah, they're on the list of it. No. Do you realize that most Christians spend most of their life waiting for angels to split the skies and tell them what to do? I'm just going to love God, go to work, take care of my kids, try to keep them get thrown out of my own house. I'm going to do it day after day after day after day. It's the normal life of men. I love God. I don't doubt that. But I'm just not sure what to do next. What I'm telling you is in this case, even one of the greatest men in the New Testament radically shifted his sense of call because one day in Antioch of Pisidia, some jealous Jews said no. And everything that followed. They didn't have to, they'd already been in prayer, right? They didn't have to go to the mountain to pray for 40 days and fast and find out the direction. Neither do you. Not saying don't pray, please pray. Not saying don't fast, please fast. But how many of you know God wants to speak to you right where you are? What generally tends to happen is we get resistance or we get an opportunity and we shrug it off, don't we? Not trying to make you feel guilty. Been there, done that. If we listen, what will be different? Isn't it easy to take a story like Paul and go, well, that's Paul. And so we read into all these things and we go, well, that's what God did with Paul. Can God do that with you? If another opportunity opens up for you to share faith in a different job. If another opportunity opens up because somebody needs the kids taken care of or the teams chased down, baseball team coach or whatever, can it give you an opportunity? Yeah. Should you be careful of those opportunities? Absolutely. I understand that we only have so much time and so much energy. I'm just saying the idea of following God's call and the opportunity to use the power of God in your life isn't that freaking mystical. Stop making it so. Oh, it's really quiet. You know, one of the things, and again, I, I'm not putting this on everybody, and this may not be you. So don't get offended. If you're offended, then go, ouch, and learn. <laughs> you know why it's so easy to sit where we are and not move? We don't have to be responsible. What happens if I go to the Gentiles and I'm wrong? What happens if God really didn't love them? What happens if I really got the scripture wrong? I could be wasting my time and my talent. I could get killed over this. I don't know. How many of us have ever felt the tug and thought, but what if? Yeah. Take the responsibility. Take the responsibility. We live in a culture that really doesn't like responsibility. They don't want to commit to marriage. They don't want to have kids. They don't want to do this. They want free and independent income given to them because they have a pulse. Free health care, free college, free this, free that, because they don't want to take responsibility for anything. How many of you know God did not design the world that way? He did not design you that way. So all I'm saying is when it comes to the spiritual directions of your life, start trusting that God can not only do big things, not, can not only have big revelations in moments of prayer, can not only have big things jump out of the scripture and you go, oh, that's me! Look for those, love those. Those are the easy, that's a low-hanging fruit, man, when God comes along and gives it that obviously. But begin to understand that God can push and nudge in directions that you're not always paying attention to. And that maybe 
listening to those matters. You bow your heads at this point. Lord Jesus, none of us are Paul. But I'm going to believe that the majority of us in here have made a commitment to follow you. Maybe not everyone. And Lord Jesus, that there's somebody in this room that has not done that. Then Lord, we've just given them a bit of a break. This isn't such a mystical faith that we have to wonder forever what God might be doing and never be sure and never have any clarity in life. No. You have a way of moving your people in the direction that you need and want them to go. And Lord, if they'll trust you today, if they'll say, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, then you can begin to walk them along in a way that helps them make the right decisions at the right time. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, it's simple as saying, Jesus, would you come into my heart? I've been trying to run this thing myself, trying to make all my own decisions, trying to make myself feel good about who I am and where I'm going, but yeah, Lord, there's some doubts and some brokenness and I'm not getting it right all the time. But I, I, I believe, maybe just because that guy up there is telling me, or maybe because I've read it before, that you came down to this earth and you lived a life just like us and yet without sin. And you went to a cross and died for me so that my flaws, my brokenness, my mistakes can be forgiven and I can make a new start. I ask you to come in, begin to guide me, let me learn to listen to you. If you start there, will you have a tremendous physical or emotional feeling in your life? Maybe. Some people do. But it's a decision. I want to walk forward from here, and I'm not assuming I'm in charge anymore. I'm assuming God's in charge. Now, I don't exactly know how that's going to work out from a day-to-day -day basis, but he's just told me that God can use small effects Things that I'm not always, you know, thinking are even there. And he can begin to influence me in one direction or another. Okay, I can live with that. God, help me to see it. Answer me, please, when I ask you a question. Let me step out in faith. It's a great start. But how many of you say, you know, I've been wondering where God wants me to use that gift, that talent, that ability. I've wondered where the power of God is supposed to be unpacked. If that's you, would just lift your hand. You're waiting for the angel, as I said, to kind of jokingly come down with a glowing scroll. How I many of you realize that your hands are up or not? It doesn't have to be that big a deal. Lord, I know that you can touch us today. I know that you can do big things. But Lord Jesus, most of the time, we can spend an entire life waiting for big things when you are filling the channels of our life with information at low levels that we're not paying attention to. Thank you that it doesn't always require angels shoving to get us to do something. Sometimes it's just learning how to live out this life where you put us. God, I pray this week we'll take the time to listen a little bit more carefully. I'm not talking about being weird and paranoid and overanalyzing everything, but we will spend a little bit more time paying attention to what's going on in our life and start wondering and praying about whether those things occasionally are directions you're giving us so that we can step out and see what you do. God, I thank you for this in the lives of each and every one of us. In your mighty name, Amen. Now, how many of you know that if you pray and you don't expect anything to happen, you really were just wasting your time? Oh, God, heal me, but I'm going to be sick. All right. Oh, God, make my marriage better, but I'm going to have a fight with that dude when I get home. All right. If you spend the time praying about something and you believe it at all, start looking for ways to do it. Understand, God's going to give you an opportunity, right? 
to give us the opportunity to step up and get it done. To look for the small things and the simple things. Sometimes the opposition. To see where God has you push into it. I'm going to ask Pastor Doug, right? You, you can come to the altar, you stay in your seat, whatever you want to do. Maybe just a, th a thought moment. Because it might be that you already could go, oh, that's what that's about. Some event in your life, right? And I could talk all day. It wouldn't make it any better for you. But the Holy Spirit can show you, this is the thing you need to pay attention to right now. It's where you start. So if they can play for us and, and lead us in some worship, we'll take some time to do that. After that, yeah, we have a business meeting. We'll take a few minutes to let you grab a coffee or whatever. Anybody can stay. Only members can go. If you don't know who you are, you're probably not a member. <laughs> That's the way that works. We'll, we'll help you with that. We, we want to communicate to you as best we can. Pastor Doug.
I love the fact that the Bible is consistent. What I told you is, if you look back at the Old Testament, how many of you know that there's a very similar story with a guy named Elijah? A guy who saw power and miracles and fire from heaven and, you know, and could, could say that there was going to be a drought and there was, said there's not going to be and there isn't. I mean, this is a guy that learned to listen to God at full volume. And when in the busiest portion of his life, he, he sees these miracles, Jezebel says he's going to kill him, and he runs into the desert. And he's saying, God, where are you, and what are you doing, and what's going on? And God calls him up on the mountainside. And all of a sudden, he, he's basically, he has to listen for God. And he sees the whirlwind that's breaking rocks, and he realizes, that's love, but that's not God. And he sees the fire burning on the mountainside, and he says, that, that's cool, but that's not God. What did God finally give him? A still, small voice. Now, was that still God? Yeah, it is. But how many of you know that's the Old Testament version of what Paul just went through in the New Testament? A still, small voice. Will you listen to it? How many of you mean, hey, you know, I, God, I, I've already performed at the big level here. Talk to me in fire. Talk to me in earthquakes. Talk to me in miracles. Still, small voice. But Elijah was, even as rattled as he was at this point in his life, understood God well enough to know when, when he was speaking. That's what we have to learn, don't we? To know when he's speaking. Which means we have to listen to hear it in the first place. Lord Jesus, I ask you to bless this congregation. Lord, my message is not meant to be aimed at saying that they don't listen. It's not the case at all. I see so many instances where they do and they hear you so well and the things that they do and say and want and believe are indicative of you flowing in their life. But Lord, we live in a world where there's an awful lot of people that will hang the name Christian on themselves that wouldn't know if you showed up and screamed in their face. They're so busy listening to the world. They're so busy listening to the economy, to politics, to anything and everything but you. They could never identify that voice. They could never feel the, the, the nudge that might come from resistance in one direction or, or effectiveness in the other. God, You've always set up the situation so that we have to have faith in you. And we have to trust in you. And so rarely do you shout. So Lord, let us listen to what you say. And let us faithfully move out, whether that's in our relationships or our job or you know, our wider family and friend circle or the way we interact with our community. Let us hear you and faithfully walk with you. In your mighty and holy name. Now, for those that are going to head home, God bless you. Have a warm, happy day with, you know, whatever you like to eat, whatever you do in your world. May it be a great one. For those of you who are sticking around for the meeting, well, let's try to get that started if we can. About 1230, will that give you time to fellowship a little bit and enjoy a cup of coffee? And I think there might be some snacks out there. I didn't think I heard somebody was going to do that. And then about 1230, we're going to go ahead and start. We'll be in here. We're not planning to take a bunch of your time today. But if you'll do that, Wally. Okay, if Mike needs a proxy vote, as long as he gives it to Jerry before he leaves. We, we don't like to do a whole lot of proxy votes. We'd rather have you hear what we're going to do. If there's some crisis thing you've got to leave for, well, yes, Jerry Noy is our secretary. He's the guy to get a ballot to. You have to come to me to get a ballot, or yeah, go to Jerry to get a ballot and fill it out. But we're, we're really hoping that everybody does a proxy and run, you know, so we, we like to... Help a meeting so there are some light ballots. All right, 1230. God bless you.